Hello, everybody. Welcome to GE Healthcare's dedicated session on deep learning reconstruction in CT and MR. I hope you are all having a great virtual ECR so far. My name is Matthias Goyen. I'm a radiologist and GE Healthcare's chief medical officer for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And I'm very happy to be your host today. In this session, we are going to talk about image reconstruction in CT and MR. We have four excellent speakers on the program today, two for CT and two for MR, followed by a short panel discussion with two of my colleagues on the topic. So let's get started with CT. In 2019, GE Healthcare introduced the first deep learning image reconstruction algorithm called True Fidelity, which has kind of set a new benchmark for CT image quality, outstanding detail and clarity with preferred texture without compromise. Last year, we introduced True Fidelity for Gemstone Spectral Imaging, GSI, another industry first with a bold vision to transform the image quality for dual energy spiral CT. Outstanding detail, clarity and texture without compromise. True Fidelity GSI CT images are more than just another next generation improvement. They truly elevate the vision of what you and True Fidelity GSI can achieve together. But let's hear from our customers. Now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Hans Niebuhr. Dr. Niebuhr is Section Chief of Emergency Radiology at the University Hospital Brussels in Belgium. His main interests are in acute stroke CT, spectral CT, artificial intelligence, polytrauma, intensive care, and mass casualty imaging. Dr. Niebuhr is an early adopter and promoter of True Fidelity, and he's going to talk about the benefits of True Fidelity for GSI, meaning spectral imaging. Let's listen to Dr. Niebuhr now. Hi, I'm Hans Niebuhr. I'm an emergency radiologist in USAID Brussels, Brussels, Belgium. And I'm happy to introduce you into the wonder world of GSI uh, True Fidelity. So this is a part of my team. Johan is my boss and um, I'm doing this with the physicist and I'm Hans Niebuhr. So this is our center, use it Brussels. We have about 200,000 contacts uh, on radiology department each year, and that makes about 42,000 CT scans. So we're not only working with DE, also the other vendors, but we have a revolution apex on the radiotherapy department, mainly used for cardiac scanning and on the emergency radiology department, which, uh, where I'm responsible for, and we have it since September last year. Um, the Revolution Apex, there are two main components which are really important uh, for the system. That's the new tube, the Quantix 160, which has uh, the possibility to go through uh, 1300 MA on a 16 centimeter set coverage uh, with uh, low KVP settings. And True Fidelity is a deep learning algorithm for your uh, image reconstructions. Why does it help in uh, the GSI, in the uh, spectral imaging, well, uh, we can go uh, combine the low KVP setting with a much higher MA setting and the higher KVP setting with a lower um, MA setting. Uh, this, this helps us to have a much uh, better energy differentiation um, and a much better image quality um, because the MA setting is best for both KVP settings. This combined with the two fidelity, so the deep learning reconstruction technique also gives us a much lower noise and this improves the image quality. This is a busy slide, but I want you to focus on the lower part. There you see that the, we have the revolution CT and the revolution apex. And the difference, of course, is the new tube. And you see that for the single KVP uh, setting, so not uh, GSI, uh, we have ex especially a better range up to the revolution uh, apex on the bariatic side. Uh, but on the GSI, we have an improvement uh, and we can actually scan more patients in the pediatric side, but also in the direction of the bariatric side. Um, 
Of course, we have a better image quality now with this uh, true fidelity uh, because we can lower the noise. So at the lower KVP settings, it will gain image quality and contrast, like you see in this 55 kilo electron volt image. And also the IDA and overlay images, uh, the texture is much better with the true fidelity combined with this new tube. So why am I using GSI in the clinical practice? Well, it's to optimize my images. There are four points. Uh, we can lower the monogram at the KV images, and this offers a higher contrast differentiation. This is really important when you are trying to uh, find small amounts of iodine. We can do material decomposition. I can check for hemorrhoids. I can check for calcification for iodine, uh, other materials like hydroxyapatite, uric acid, fat, or other materials. What is really important also in routinely scanning is that we have a fertile unenhanced reconstruction. And this is a radiation uh, dose saving. We don't hardly scan any uh, non-contrast scans anymore when we have a monophasic scan like a venous abdominal scan or a free phasic scan becomes a two phasic scan. And then we have the metal artifact reduction, which is known um, as a good point of dual energy scanning or spectral imaging. Um, and we use it mainly, mainly in the dental artifact reduction, coils and clips, prothesis and forging bodies to reduce these artifacts coming from these materials. So best known example is, of course, the pulmonary embolism scans, the PE scan. Of course, we can use it to find uh, small clots. So here we have a 60 kilo electron volt image with uh, a very small clot in the sub-segmental uh, brands. But what is really interesting is that you have a very nice smooth uh, iodine images, sorry, um, and you can actually see on the iodine maps the perfusion defects, which can be uh, calculated in DSI permanent perfusion software. It's uh, on the HW, and you get uh, the reports with the amount of perfusion defect, uh, which is uh, due to this uh, pulmonary emboli. And this is at a really reasonable dose level, in this case of uh, 4.1 milligray. Of course, what's really imp uh, imp uh, important when you have a PE scan that you also have a good quality of your um, lung reconstructions. In this case, here's crown class opacity visible and uh, some small thickening of the secondary pulmonary lobely uh, in cardiac failure. And it's also important to have good uh, image quality on this reconstructions. When we go to acute abdominal imaging, of course, the best known uh, indication is, for example, you, uh, the kidney stone scan. In this case, this patient had two uh, stones. One is here in the left kidney. Uh, if we take a look at the calcium oxalate images, it's visible. It's also visible on the uric acid. But when we uh, take a look at this absorption curve, you see that it follows the curve of calcium oxalate. The other, and that's a pathologic uh, stone, is here in the right ureter, in the proximal ureter, gives the hydronephrosis. It is not visible on calcium ox uh, oxidate uh, images. It is visible on the uric acid images, so it has a high uric acid content. And when you take the slope, this is purple line, it has the same slope as the uric acid material uh, curve. So this is a uric acid stone. It's treated differently from the calcium uh, stones. The same patient had a, uh, a CT scan of the kidney stones in 2017 on our revolution CT with ACV. And if you take a look at the image quality, these are thin slice coronal images, 0.6 millimeter, 0.7 millimeter. Uh, we could go from 4.3 uh, milligray to 2.6 milligray with the combination of DSI, true fidelity um, with the, uh, this deep learning reconstruction technique. This is not a case of acute abnormal imaging. A patient with pancreatitis one month ago and came in with acute abnormal pain. We see here in the arterial phase an enhancement of a nodule structure. Uh, it's clearly visible on the iodine images in the lower row. And this is the portal venous phase where you see the ongoing enhancement of this structure. This is a pseudoaneurysm and there's a little um, density next to it. And we can clearly see this as a calcification on the fertile and enhanced images. So I didn't do a non-contrast series, so I saved radiation dose for this patient. And here we see the confirmation on the um, angiogram. This is a gastroduodenal pseudoanimism. Same patient was, as I said, one month before in the hospital, and they did uh, the scan with arms down. 
And in this case, I don't use the DSI. I will use only True Fidelity with KV Assist 2.0. And the top row we have seen, and the low row is the image quality with the KV Assist 2.0 combined with True Fidelity. This was an acute case of an uh, incarcerated uh, inquinal hernia. Uh, we see the uh, iodine content in the bowel walls and in the uh, vessels in this uh, herniation. It's confirmed here uh, on the color overlay. And it's really important that we can say there is still iodine in the bowel wall. In this case, uh, there's no necrosis of the bowel wall. What is also important that we use always the MAR uh, on this system. So this is the control scan, and this is the final reconstruction where we see the improvement of the image quality using the MAR in spectral imaging. Another case of oncologic imaging, this is a coincidental finding. Uh, this nodule, is it enhancing or not? We only did a venous phase. But on the virtual enhanced scan, it stays hyperdense. It's not enhancing on the iodine images. So this proves that this is an hemorrhagic cyst. So it doesn't create new diagnosis. We knew that it's probably a hemorrhagic cyst, but now we are sure it's a hemorrhagic cyst and not uh, an enhancing mass. Finally, in musculoskeletal imaging, there was a patient uh, was sent by a family doctor for an MRI, but we couldn't get an MRI. Um, for her immediately, so I said we do spectral imaging. This is the bone reconstruction. There's a tiny line there. She was uh, suspected from a scaphoid fracture, but it's really clear visible on the water uh, HAP images. So this is a water image uh, showing uh, bone marrow edema. And this is the actual and sagittal reconstruction where you can confirm this uh, non-displaced fracture. A last case of musculoskeletal imaging. Patient fell from a ladder. Uh, she had an older uh, L1 fracture. It's there. And the question is, what is, is there a new fracture or not? Quite difficult to see. But if you take a look at these water HAP images, you see that the L1 is blue. There's hardly any uh, water in it. But the T12 is green, so there's a water content. And it's confirmed uh, in the sagittal plane. There's a difficult to see, but visible um, fracture. And this is the coronal plane, so it's an oblique fracture for this D12 vertebral body. So why do you use DSI uh, true fidelity in the clinical practice in routine? Well, optimization of my images, not making new diagnosis, but being more sure of my diagnosis. I do lower monochromatic key fee images that offer high contrast differentiation. We use material decomposition. We use fertile and enhanced reconstructions to save radio radiation dose. And we use always the metal artifact reduction. So, if possible, I always have on this system my DSI on uh, with the arms up and the arms are down. I will use the um, normal uh, monochromatic, uh, the, the normal scanning uh, methods with true fidelity. And I always have my MAR on with DSI MAR or Smart MAR on conventional imaging. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, very impressive what Dr. Niebuhr just shared. Really superb image quality. I think True Fidelity GSI has the potential to enhance the diagnostic performance for almost all types of patients and clinical areas. Let's now move to Professor Ulf Teichgräber. Professor Teichgräber is the chairman of radiology at Jena University in Germany. He's going to explain how True Fidelity has changed his mind, creating a new benchmark for CT image quality. Let's listen. This was quite interesting. Uh, we have uh, we are using True Fidelity as um, um, deep learning image reconstruction uh, since uh, already one and a half years. So we we have been. The very first uh, center, uh, not only in Europe, I think we were worldwide the very first who um, were using uh, True Fidelity uh, for, for patients uh, in clinical routine. So this started uh, one and a half years ago and um, uh, during the Easter uh, um, holidays uh, here in Germany where GE installed the True Fidelity on our um, uh, CT revolution scanner. I was actually on, on vacation at this time and someone sent me for after the first day of installment the first images and I was lying at the pool and was seeing that on my laptop 
and I was thinking, wow, this was really a difference because the images I got were on the one hand side, um, the uh, old acquisition, uh, no, no, not the old reconstruction form with Acer. So uh, iterative reconstruction, which, which was up to that time, our standard, and then the true fidelity uh, images. And the difference was so amazing. Uh, and this was true, not only uh, for uh, body images, it was for chest as well as for ab abdomen. And the most uh, I was impressed of was then right from the beginning on was uh, um, uh, the angiography, CT angiography and reconstructions, which were really so brilliant that I was really so much astonished. Um, this is, I, I, I would think, um, true fidelity, honestly, really boost most of the uh, um, image quality in all fields where we are working in. The newer images for the brain, for the uh, for the um, uh, spine, it's uh, getting much better uh, quality, and uh, also for abdominal imaging, it's uh, um, uh, um, getting very sharp uh, organ uh, delineation. And also very astonishing is, uh, although it was there is no special um, uh, um, uh, image reconstruction or um, um, filter for the lungs. Is also lung imaging uh, where I'm in the um, in so much impressed about that it is really a big improvement. And um, for cardiac imaging uh, for the coronary arteries, you're really getting now an image quality which is uh, superb uh, compared uh, so much better than than before. Uh, not that you get uh, really. And more clinical information, but only the quality itself. So the noise uh, erasure uh, is much better. The delineation of the structures is better. And you still have the impression that you have uh, not so much noise in the image as before as with iterative reconstruction. Yeah. So um, uh, me as uh, chairman of the department, of course, is uh, I'm more or less a specialist on all fields, but from my heart, I'm really uh, very much in the uh, cardiovascular imaging. Therefore, um, uh, um, CT angiography is probably the mo the one the, the field I'm uh, using the most. Uh, and um, and reading the most, and there I have to see as well as for um, coronary um, angiography itself. It's uh, it's, it's very uh, it gives us a perfect quality, but also for the angiographies uh, of the uh, other organ systems, let's say our order uh, or uh, pelvic arteries or even uh, cerebral arteries, uh, um, wherever you're using angiography, uh, you're getting um, a much sharper and better impression of the images. So it's a, a big, uh, big step uh, forward uh, using true fidelity for angiography. Uh, we have seen that we are able to uh, lower the dose uh, depending on the organ system uh, by between 30 to 50 percent without from our impression because it's only a subjective impression without loss of image quality uh, or significant of course with lowering the dose you will have less quality so you're getting more more noise but it's still even with lowering the dose it's still superior um, uh, image quality as compared to ASA uh, um, uh, ASA 50 percent or 40 percent in image reconstruction so um, therefore this is really a potential for future where I believe that uh, if you're using it on a, a broad way uh, um, image reconstruction that uh, you will be able depending on the organ where you were working in with a minimum of 20% up to probably 50-60% of um, um, radiation dose uh, reconstruct uh, radiation dose reduction um, as compared <clears throat> uh, um, to uh, the previous ASAR so iterative reconstruction. So this is a real big uh, potential of um, true fidelity. If, um, if we show uh, these images right now um, uh, on radiology conference, conferences uh, um, locally in Germany or, or even last year at the RSNA, um, and it is uh, that most of the um, colleagues are very impressed. But um, this is not what is, what is important. 
uh, what is actually important is how do we react our referring physicians in-house where we presenting our images and uh, from the first uh, um, uh, introduction and you have to see we are using true fidelity nearly on uh, most applications that means for 80 percent of our uh, um, applications our scans are done with true fidelity the only thing is uh, GSI images where we don't use it, but most applications, all other applications, all uh, CT angiographies are done with true fidelity and clinical routine. And for our physicians, uh, these great reconstructive images and this uh, unnoisy images, so these perfect images, are totally routine right now. So they are really uh, are more complaining if they say, well, we, we, we have here some uh, images from another hospital. For example, where we uh, where we also get referrals from from, 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 from from patients, we say, well, these are these are so noisy. It's like, no, this is this is a normal uh, image uh, <laughs> from a really good scanner, actually. Uh, but uh, this is uh, what actually uh, deep learning reconstruction is uh, is about. It's really getting better image quality, and we as radiologists want to bring to our um, uh, to our referring physicians also good image quality. Of course also to our patients but the ones who are doing their image uh, they're doing their clinical decisions on are mainly our referring physicians and therefore i think uh, this was very convincing to them it's always highly educational to listen to professor teichgraber we are very happy to have such a great partnership with him we are now transitioning from ct to mr from true fidelity to air recon dl air recon dl DL for deep learning is GE Healthcare's deep learning based reconstruction algorithm that is part of the AIR family of products that GE Healthcare has designed to improve the door to door MR experience from patient setup to diagnosis. You could say AIR Recon DL is a new opportunity to overcome the inherent limitations coming with conventional MR reconstruction where signal to noise ratio, acquisition time, or spatial resolution are all tied out together. It is now a great pleasure for me to introduce to you our first MR speaker, Dr. Daryl Sneak, who works as Director of Peripheral Nerve MRI at the Hospital for Special Surgery, HSS, in New York. Two years ago, GE Healthcare and HSS collaborated together to clinically assess the benefits of deep learning-based reconstruction for orthopedic imaging. This clinical study eventually led to the commercially available product known as Air Recon DL nowadays. Now let's hand it off to Dr. Daryl Sneak, who's going to talk about the clinical study and early clinical feedback. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and the ability to talk today about my experience with Air Recon DL. MR neurography has been recognized as being clinically significant only recently. MRI, however, has been recognized as a tool to image peripheral nerves since the early 1990s, but only recently has the impact of high resolution 3T MR neurography been shown to impact diagnostic thinking and therapeutic patient management. Peripheral neuropathy is common with approximately 3% prevalence in the general population and about an 8% prevalence in those individuals 55 and above. Recent software and hardware uh, technological advancements have enabled us to increase our clinical volume significantly between the years 2017 and 2020 as we're able to generate images that I think are clinically meaningful and help referring physicians manage their patients. Notice the blip during COVID and the uh, resurgence of the clinical volume since then. Precise localization of pathology with neuromuscular imaging or MR neurography is possible. And I'd like to illustrate one example in which we're able to detect pathology not only of the whole nerve itself, but individual fascicular bundles of the nerve that so essentially we're seeing with inside the nerve. So in this example, the green, yellow, and red arrows point to abnormal fascicular bundles of the median nerve above the elbow. 
In this patient with anterior interosseous neuropathy, she's unable to oppose her thumb and index finger to perform such activities such as picking up a coin off a table or buttoning her shirt. This has enabled precise targeted microneurolysis of the nerve in which surgeons need only to open up a small portion of the patient's arm rather than the entire arm during an exploration surgery, if you will, and unravel or release those constrictions. And here she was able to nicely oppose her thumb and index finger following internal microneurolysis of the median nerve. And this has been reported by myself and my colleagues. However, the challenge with traditional two-dimensional MR neurography techniques is to acquire adequate spatial resolution within a clinically reasonable scan time. Our standard approach involves use of high-performance gradients at 3T and high-element surface coils. Parallel imaging techniques can be helpful, but typically incur SNR penalties due to undersampling and noise amplification. An AI-based image reconstruction is therefore attractive to decrease scan times peripheral nerve imaging. Just as one illustration in terms of approaches that we use, in April 2013, we see coronal T2-weighted fat-suppressed images from the same patient with a large peripheral nerve sheet tumor arising from her distal plexus. Here on the left, the use of an 8-channel cardiac coil, and on the right, in July 2020, with the use of 32-channel flexible coils. Air Recon DL is an AI-enhanced image reconstruction pipeline, which operates on raw image data to produce high-quality images and has been trained using a curated database of more than 10,000 high-quality images. We performed a study which was previously presented at last year's RSNA. Our objective was to evaluate the performance of a new deep learning-based MR reconstruction method that is DL Recon for the clinical evaluation of peripheral nerves. Our hypothesis was that significant agreement in clinically relevant outcome measures would exist between conventionally reconstructed standard of care or SOC MRIs and deep learning reconstructed, that is DL Recon MRIs. We evaluated 28 subjects, 16 female, average age of 50, who underwent three Tesla clinical MRIs uh, using protocols that comprise at least one axial two-dimensional intermediate weighted fast spin echo sequence. The image data was then reconstructed using a conventional approach on your left and a DL-based reconstruction approach on your right. Notice the markedly more conspicuous fascicular architecture of the sciatic nerve at the level of the ischial tuberosity or the hamstring origins. We graded images using the following parameters. One, whether the radiologist could tell whether the reconstruction method was DL recon or standard of care. We evaluated outer epineurium conspicuity, fascicular architecture, pulsation artifact, as well as aliasing artifact and potential bulk or gross motion. We evaluated the grading differences between the DL recon and standard of care MRIs and found that for bulk and pulsation artifact, as well as outer epineurium conspicuity, there was no statistical significant difference for grading differences. However, there was a statistically significant difference in terms of the fascicular architecture between the standard of care reconstruction and the dl base reconstruction, noting that the dl base reconstruction shows much more conspicuous internal fascicular architecture in these two examples on the top row and the bottom row with the two different reconstructions in these patients with the spontaneous median neuropathies. And so following this project, we asked ourselves, can we apply DL Recon more broadly to musculoskeletal imaging beyond the peripheral nervous system? And so these were a few preliminary examples using the same DL-based uh, method to evaluate, for example, here, the elbow cartilage. Note the much more conspicuous superficial layer of the cartilage. Imaging of the thumb in this, what I call an ultra high resolution proton density image. Note the spatial resolution of 0.14 by 0.18 in plane, and the much sharper image on your right of the DL recon compared to the left image. In the wrist, using a prototype coil here, we're imaging at a six centimeter field of view, 
Notice the beautiful DL Recon image on your right. The conventional image is pretty good, but notice that it's noisy and it's hard, at least in my mind, to be confident about the chondral detail on this coronal image. And so essentially what it comes down to, at least in my mind, and I think hopefully Rob, but you would agree as well, that there's a balance with imaging in terms of the contrast you're trying to achieve, the spatial resolution, and the acquisition time. And all these parameters without DL recon or without another reconstruction technique need to be balanced to achieve adequate image quality and efficiency. And my experience has been that DL Recon was able to achieve high image quality and efficiency without compromising spatial resolution or contrast. So just to kind of go into this a little bit more detail, there's a challenge sometimes between SNR and spatial resolution. So here we're showing here a conventional, relatively low resolution coronal image of the knee, but high SNR. If we try to increase our spatial resolution, now going from an in-plane of 0.6 by 0.6 to now 0.4 by 0.4, then the image becomes noisy. But if we apply DL Recon, now at a 0.4 in-plane resolution, we now have adequate SNR with a high resolution acquisition. Conversely, if we look at adjusting acquisitions or the number of acquisitions or necks, and, and contrast this with SNR and acquisition time. On the conventional, on the image on the left, this is a 0.3 in-plane resolution image at two necks, approximately two and a half minutes. And you'll notice it's somewhat noisy. Notice the oblique horizontal tear of the posterior horn medial meniscus with a small, small uh, parameniscal uh, ganglion cyst along the capsular junction. And if we try to, what we believe is to uh, obtain adequate SNR in this experiment, we need to acquire a 20 minute long sequence using 16 necks. However, if we take our conventional acquisition at two necks and run it through our air recon DL algorithm now, now we've obtained an image of similar SNR, uh, at least visually compared to the conventional image on your right in two and a half minutes time compared to a potentially 20 minute acquisition, which obviously no one in the right mind should run. Uh, another uh, similar theme, but uh, slightly different, is the use of Air Recon DL to obtain very large field of views, which typically uh, would result in penalties related to spatial resolution. So you, if you obtain a very large field of view, you have to go really, really high on your, uh, your matrix size in order to maintain your in-plane resolution, and this occurs uh, time penalty. So, so in the conventional uh, acquisition, we're looking at the uh, gray toe MP joint. We see really uh, noisy image of the cartilage, but using air recon DL of these feet on the right and zooming up into that gray toe MP joint, we see very crisp high SNR image. And so now I'd like to shift gears and describe how you know, uh, following our initial experiments, applying to peripheral nerves and to a few joints, of really now being able to take Air Recon DL mainstream to HSS, and particularly in the COVID era. And this is on our GE Cigna Premier 3T system. We recently upgraded to the Cigna Works Air IQ edition. So now we have in a product version, uh, the DL Recon. And I'm very uh, excited to, to, uh, to say that we'll be able to run DL Recon as a product as well on uh, two systems in the main hospital that are gonna be upgraded very soon. And I think what this has allowed us to do, as I'll show you in a moment, is to modify our protocols to really maintain or actually improve our spatial re resolution. And as Rob alluded to, we never want to compromise spatial resolution here at HSS, um, but actually speed things up. And this has been particularly important, uh, as everyone knows here in the COVID era, as we need to allow for a little bit more time to properly disinfect uh, all our uh, magnets, to maintain spacing uh, throughout uh, the day. So what we've done here, and this has really been uh, uh, assisted uh, work together with uh, Holly Blanick and G and Maggie Fung, is take our existing protocols and apply Air Recon DL, modify some parameters, and actually reduce our scan time here in the shoulder by almost 40%. 
So here our current protocol or our pre-existing protocol on the left and our slightly modified protocol on the right, notice a change in the 1.5 to 1 next, we're actually increasing our frequency encoding steps, so increasing our in-plane resolution, and notice much sharper visualization of the glenohumeral cartilage in the shoulder. Here also note that there's a faster scan time in the Air Recon DL, and on your left we see some motion artifact that is not present on the Air Recon DL image. Here in the knee, almost a 50% reduction in scan time. And again, beautiful visualization here of the femoral tibial cartilage. Similarly in the ankle, over 50% reduction in scan time. Nice visualization of the tibio tailor cartilage, very crisp on your right, as compared to the current, the, sorry, the previous protocol on the left. In the hip as well, similar theme with Air Recon DL. We see nice visualization of this patient, unfortunately, with bad uh, osteoarthritis and inciting synovitis. So I'd just like to uh, wrap up by showing a couple of clinical cases. Those were volunteers that I just showed you. This is a 42-year-old female. It's kind of hot off the press images uh, over the last month in which we've been applying the DL uh, recon into our routine practice. Again, 42-year-old female with a recent anterior shoulder dislocation. So here we see a hill sex lesion stripping of the IgA gel from the scapula. Notice the subtle labral tear as well on the actual image on your right. Here a 53-year-old man with advanced glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Notice the bulky loose bodies layering dependently within the axillary pouch. And also notice the visualization of a somewhat subtle tear, intrasubstance tear of the subscapularis superior fibers. 35-year-old male with the ACL reconstruction. And I think this is really a beautiful example of when you obtain very high um, in-plane resolution with high SNR, able to nicely pick up this hyper-intense ACL graft, which represents the expected ligamentization of the tendon graft without disruption of its fibers. And here we also nicely visualize the suture line along the femur. This 45-year-old woman with chronic sacroiliitis Note the very sharp appearance of these chronic appearing erosive changes on both sides of the sacroiliac joints. And lastly, a 61-year-old male with degenerative lumbar spine disease. And you can take the same protocols, or I should say, sorry, you can take the same algorithm, and if you will, reduce exam times even further to under five minutes, really without sacrificing resolution or signal in so-called hyperspeed protocols. Here in the knee, under five minutes with five acquisitions, and in the cervical spine, under five minutes again. Well, I'd like to thank you so much uh, again, Rob, for your the invitation to speak with you today about DL Recon. I'd like to thank uh, MR Lab at HSS, and uh, with DL Recon or other techniques, we can even fit additional people in. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Exun Tan, who uh, helped me put this talk together today. Really fantastic work that Dr. Sneak and colleagues have been doing and a great partnership with GE Healthcare. Last but not least, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Christopher Alas. Dr. Alas is a diagnostic radiologist and the CEO of Radiomed in Germany. That is a private radiology group operating around 10 centers in the Frankfurt area. When Air Recon DL was deployed at clinical sites in Europe, it was actually at Radiomate where one of the very first systems was installed on their existing 3T Signar Pioneer MR scanner. Let's listen to Dr. Alas. So in 2015, we installed the Signa Pioneer as uh, one of five uh, pilot installations globally. And since then, uh, we installed the upcoming releases. The system is now in a state in which is uh, in no way comparable to 2015. We're still uh, on cutting edge technology with uh, the current system. With the prior software version PX28, we introduced the air coils. Uh, the flexible coils um, that delivered us uh, a lot of additional SNR and, and great image quality. 
Um, with that come the workflow features, AirX, automatic planning in your exams, and also um, Air Touch, automatic selection of coil elements and coil positioning. And finally, the reconstruction techniques, Air Recon, and then uh, the latest version, Air Recon DL, with deep learning based image reconstruction. After installation of the new software, um, the very first images came out really impressive. Uh, we were really impressed by the extent of noise reduction uh, we can uh, notice in the images. So this example nicely demonstrates the extent of uh, noise reduction by Ericon DL. On the left hand side you see the regular perfusion image with relatively high noise and on the right hand side the denoised image by Ericon DL. So by implementing Ericon DL into most of our standard protocols we've seen significant increase in image quality um, and also spatial resolution. And also we've observed a decrease in the scan times. So for example, for our standard shoulder protocol, uh, we've been able to cut that down to about five minutes uh, net scan time. Certain types of artifacts like Gibbs springing artifacts decrease with Ericon DL. And uh, uh, we really like that. And uh, there, there is a significant difference to uh, using image filters. While this uh, may have also a negative impact on, on image quality and uh, possibly um, decreased details uh, in the images, uh, we don't see this behavior with Ericon DL. This example nicely shows a series with a relatively small FOF and small voxel size around 0.5 millimeters. And in the standard reconstruction, we notice a significant image noise and in comparison with a Recon DL, significantly decreased uh, while preserving uh, details of the image. Once again, side by side, on the right hand side, standard reconstruction, on the left hand side, a Recon DL. We don't have any restrictions in, in terms of anatomy. Uh, we can use it in, in uh, nearly all of our protocols. In prostate exam, according to the PIRATES protocol, we uh, have a significant time that is needed for the three-plane T2 FSE. And uh, using Ericon DL, we've been able to uh, significantly shorten this time from um, roughly 12 minutes to uh, less than half uh, below six minutes. Also in L-spine, we see uh, a much more appealing image quality due to the re reduced noise level. Um, and also we've been able to significantly shorten the scan times. Ericon DL delivers images that are just more appealing and uh, less exhausting to read because it's just um, easier to pick up the image details. And also it frees up some time uh, we, we uh, possibly can use to uh, do an additional series where necessary. Uh, and I think therefore it, it definitely does uh, has a positive impact on diagnostic confidence. So uh, due to the um, recent changes in the, in the billing system, uh, we've seen declining reimbursement for the individual examinations. And uh, Recon DL helps us to um, answer this um, challenge by increasing our productivity, by uh, speeding up the individual uh, protocols uh, and also due to the COVID pandemic we um, need additional time for sanitation and cleaning after the patients and uh, Ericon DL helps, DL helps uh, to free up some time. An overall summary regarding Ericon DL relatively short after um, introducing it is that we're really impressed by the extent of uh, denoising capability of the uh, algorithm and uh, we will leverage this power into our protocols by uh, increasing spatial resolution, increasing image quality uh, and also uh, increase our productivity. So overall uh, it's very impressive. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've just heard from Dr. Alas, Air Recon DL takes image quality to a new level. The radiologist no longer has to choose between short scan times, high resolution and high SNR, but can achieve everything equally in one scan. 
We are now moving to a short panel discussion, and I would like to introduce to you two of my dear colleagues, Hakan Grundin, our European Product Marketing Manager CT, as well as Bastien Perez, our EMMA Product Marketing Manager for Europe. Hakan, Bastien, welcome to the panel discussion. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Welcome. So let's get right into it. Watching the interviews, testimonials, and the presentations, I was wondering what were your design goals when you developed your respective deep learning reconstruction algorithms? And now more than one year after the release, does the feedback from our customers match your initial design goals? Maybe, maybe Hakan, you go first. Yes, thank you, Matthias. Yeah, the, the original design goals was, was to get rid of the trade-off that we previously had with iterative reconstruction. So we all know that iterative reconstructions was developed to get rid of the noise in the CT images, and by doing that, lower the dose. And, and But when iterative reconstruction is removing the noise from the CT images, it also creates some kind of blurry image texture. So the design goal for True Fidelity is quite easy. It's to be able to reduce the noise in the images. This means that we are creating a dedicated image quality to match the need of the radiologists. And, and, and how they use that, it, it's going to be very different, right? So the initial feedback in the early implementations for True Fidelity in CT has been that they immediately like the image quality. Some sites are using it just to enjoy the improved image quality. Other sites are using it to, to simply uh, reconstruct the thinner slice thickness. And other sites are reducing the radiation dose. So, so we are basically creating a tool set for them to use. That's really great to hear, Harkan. Bastien. Yeah, as far as more, you, you've said it extremely well. The, the trade-off of conventional reconstruction are very well known. It's a very subtle balance between spatial resolution, signal to noise ratio, and scan time. Typically, the better you make one, the worse the other two will get. So the true goal of every DL was really to move away from this trade-off uh, trying to bring more clinical potential, but also uh, better throughput opportunities. We've been working with a couple of sites across Europe for a little bit more than half a year now, and I think the best way to assess if every DL is performing per the goal is to look at the data coming from scanner. So we've looked at the MR data, and so far it's been very promising. Every single time every Candiel is used for the protocol, we've seen a reduction in voxel size. So this is directionally a better spatial resolution, but it also comes with better throughput. And I would call it an easier way of looking at the images because your SNR is significantly better. So we are very, I would say we are on the right track to, uh, to achieve our goal. That's really uh, great to hear, uh, Bastien. As, as always, when a new reconstruction technology is released, it is extremely important that the users have clinical confidence. How did you verify the accuracy of the images before you release the algorithms? Um, who wants to go first? Maybe Bastien? Yeah, I can take this one, uh, Matthias. Uh, I'd say that clinical confidence is very much related with the early stage of development of the technology, even before it's becoming a product. Um, you heard it from Dr. Sneeg. It was one of our first clinical partners. We collaborated together comparing a conventional reconstruction with every DL reconstruction, making sure first that no lesion was missed and making sure that you could really see more details, better image quality with every DL. Once this is validated, clinically relevant, this is when we bring every DL to the main reconstruction pipeline of an MR as our customer know it as a product. That's really awesome. Hakan. Yeah, that's a great question, Matthias. Uh, so, so basically that, that occurs every time we release something new in reconstruction. So if you change the iterative reconstruction or if you develop a new kernel, this question will always occur, right? 
but we, we actually train the deep neural network with thousands of clinical data sets for it to be comprehensive over all body regions. And, and, and afterwards, when we design the deep uh, neural network and, and we design the reconstruction algorithm, we force the deep neural network to reconstruct images it has not been trained on. So, so, so it was phantom scans, it was clinical scans, and, and those, those challenging scans we pushed to, to the deep convolution network, they were very rare cases and extremely challenging to confirm the robustness of, of, of the reconstruction. We also performed something called subtraction imaging, which means that we are, we are using a, a standard image, which we know contains all the information of the, of the patient or the phantom, and then we subtracted it to, to the image from true fidelity. And by subtracting images versus each other, we can be sure that we don't miss any anat anatomy or pathology in the cases. That's great. Thanks a lot, Hakan. I was wondering, in, in general, it usually takes some time until a new technology becomes a standard practice, a standard of reference, is, and is really introduced into clinical practice. Can you comment on the speed of adoption here of early clinical users? Maybe Bastian. Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, MR is usually associated with very long adoption cycle. I think this is also coming from, from the complexity of MR. Uh, it was true in the past with technology like a parallel imaging or even compress sensing. Uh, what we wanted to achieve with every Condiel first is to make users comfortable with that technology. So we've led the possibility to reconstruct images both with and without every Condiel so that you have a couple of weeks to you know, get comfortable with the technology. And after a couple of weeks, you can get rid of the original image. And second, uh, the technology shouldn't bring any discomfort in the workflow. So what, what really important for us and our engineers work really hard on this is to make sure that the Eric DL images get reconstructed real time and always sent straight to the image console and that's why I think we've had a fantastic adoption with Eric on DL so far. Awesome. Hawken. Yeah, uh, we had a different strategy in CT. So, so we, we, we didn't know what to expect from the customers. We actually offered them trial licenses. And so we allowed them to test it for three or four months period. And, 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 and the strategy of implementation of the CT scanners is not to include it in the automatic exposure control. So they, they turned True Fidelity on. They were at the same radiation doses as they were with iterative reconstruction. And I can tell you, all of, of our customers experienced a wow feeling. And the feedback, as you heard from Professor Teichgräber, was immediately when they saw it for the different body regions, they say, we want it turned on for everything. And, and eventually, the different sites develop in different paths, as I earlier said. So some reduce the dose, some reduce the slice thickness. Some just enjoyed the new image quality. But then we created a new demand on the CT market. And so initially, we only re released it for a single energy scanning. So what about spectral imaging? Uh, the feedback from our users was we, we, we need this for everything, right? So, and that is why in this RSNA, we actually released True Fidelity also for spectral imaging. And it's setting a new standard in image quality with spectral imaging as well. Thank you very much, Horkan. Uh, uh, maybe I have a final question for you guys. We heard a lot of excitement and potential regarding deep learning applied to image reconstruction. Are there other areas you can think of where deep learning could bring improvements in general to the radiology department? Um, Hakan? Yeah, we, we see huge potential and we are only scratching the surface with, with, with true fidelity for image reconstruction. Uh, starting with different kind of re reconstruction modes, I mean, we, we are seeing a big opportunity not just to use it for, for image quality, but also to make the field of view larger. We actually have already implemented an algorithm to, to do something we call extended field of view, meaning reconstructing the CT images all the way to the bore of the CT scanners. When it comes to organ segmentation, especially for RT purposes, I, I see a huge opportunity to have automatic organ segmentation, saving a lot of time in, in post-processing, right? Uh, automatic alignment of anatomies like, like the brain, it, it, that can be done very, very well by, by, by deep learning. 
and also the workflow itself, like selecting the right protocol, positioning the patient, decision support for radiologists, uh, and uh, not least, I see huge improvement for, for the serviceability of our systems, for the deep learning to predict where, where could we have a problem with the CT scanner? How can we easiest you know, resolve the problem? And also to predicting like, like, like future tube failures to make sure that we do proactive tube changes to, to eliminate the downtime to our customers. This is really awesome, awesome. very promising. So the future is, uh, is bright. Uh, Hawken, so anything to add, Bastien? Yeah, I mean, I really share the same excitement from radiologists, but also from Okan. I think we're going to hear a lot about deep learning for the coming years. It's going to transform entirely the door-to-door -door MR experience. Um, if I take what Okan says about um, organ segmentation, this is something we started to implement uh, with regard to prostate contouring which is a step super important when you look at the pirate evaluation. So we already see that deep learning is really bringing um, speed, accuracy, and remove that burden from the radiologist. It doesn't have to do the contouring manually. Um, of course, every DL fundamentally addresses the image quality. But if you take a step back, even before getting the images, you need the technologies to prescribe the MR slices. And I think that this is an area where deep learning has proven to be extremely accurate, extremely efficient, because if you train a neural network the right way, it will always bring the same MR slices regardless of your technologies, regardless of the patient's positioning inside the MR coil, and regardless of time. So it will significantly improve your longitudinal studies and your follow-up. So I really share the excitement from everybody. Deep learning is really a, a massive improvement for the radiology department. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of our session. On behalf of GE Healthcare, I would like to thank all speakers for their presentation, interviews, testimonials, as well uh, as you, of course, Hawken and Bastien, for the panel discussion. And of course, I would like to thank you, the audience, for taking the time to listen. Have a great virtual ECR and don't forget to stop by our booth. Have a great day, everybody, and hopefully see you on the road again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.